Welcome to the Coin Stories podcast, where we talk about investing, hard money, Bitcoin, and how technology is revolutionizing the global economy. I'm Natalie Brunel, and I'm here to learn with you. So this is for educational and entertainment purposes only. None of the discussions should constitute as official investment advice, and you should always do your own research. Make sure you're subscribed to my page so you don't miss out on any new content. This show is made possible through partnerships with companies I trust, and I'm very picky about who I partner with. So I hope you take the time to listen to the ad reads throughout the show. First up, Swan. I partnered with Swan because it is a Bitcoin-only company that is focused on helping people save for their future and self-custody their Bitcoin. Swan can help you start a direct deposit to take advantage of Bitcoin as a savings technology and learn how to take it off the exchange. Swan also offers retirement planning with an IRA, tax loss harvesting, and a white glove private client service. I use Swan to dollar cost average, and I deposit a little bit every day that's equivalent to what I might spend on a meal so that I add to my future nest egg and lower my yearly cost basis. Swan Studios produces my hard money news reports, simplifying Bitcoin for mass audiences and documenting Bitcoin adoption around the world. To learn more and get $10 in free Bitcoin, head to swanbitcoin.com slash Natalie Brunel. All right, next up, Bitcoin Conference 2024, the world's largest Bitcoin event, is headed to Nashville next year. Early bird tickets are now available, and this is the lowest cost you'll be able to secure for the conference all year. And if you use the code HODL, H-O-D-L, you'll get an extra 10% off. So come join us for three great days of networking events, panels, keynotes, workshops, and more. You never know what big name might be announced when tickets are much, much higher in price. Head to b.tc slash conference and use the code HODL. I'll see you there. All right, it's time for the show. Hi, everyone. Welcome back. If you don't know this Bitcoiner, you are missing out. I'm so proud to call Dr. Susie Riley a friend, and you have to follow her on Twitter, X, whatever you call it, because she has one of the funniest pages out there. Susie, thanks so much for joining me on the show. No, thanks so much for having me, Nat. I'm excited to be here and thankful to call you my friend as well. Well, I'm so excited to hear your Bitcoin journey because you have such an interesting backstory, a career dentist retired recently. You have a clinic in El Zante I want to talk to you about. Um, but let's just start from the very beginning. Where are you originally from? Tell me a little bit about your, your career in dentistry and how you got into Bitcoin. Uh, so I grew up in San Francisco um, and then went to Ohio State for dental school where I met my husband. And we settled on Atlanta to practice dentistry together. Uh, bought a practice there in 1998. And uh, practice until this year, uh, sold our practice and have retired to Hawaii. Um, along the way in 2018 is when I first started purchasing Bitcoin that my teen son at the time asked me to buy it. Uh, I just did it to appease him. It wasn't something that I studied or believed in at all. Um, but that has led me down like so many Bitcoiners, uh, just many rabbit holes. And I think it really changed how my husband and I saw our careers that we love dentistry. We were incredibly successful, had all of the trappings of success, but Bitcoin made us realize that those trappings that we, you know, enjoyed our cars, our homes, you know, all of the vacations felt like traps. They no longer felt like a reward anymore. And so we started in 2021 looking at selling everything and trading our time for freedom instead of fiat. Wow. Okay. I want to dig into a little bit more of that because one of the things that amazed me is when you told me at one point that you sold your house to buy Bitcoin. So before we get there, um, let's just talk a little bit more about money. I mean, growing up, did you choose dentistry because it was going to potentially bring you financial stability, something that looked like it was going to be lucrative? Um, tell me a little bit about kind of your backstory with money. Um, so uh, I didn't go into um, college thinking that I would be a dentist. Um, in fact, it seemed like a disgusting career to me. I wanted to go into academia. I loved, um, I loved research. I loved publishing. But one of the grad students in our lab, his father was a dentist. He had a standing Friday date with him since dentists don't work on Friday generally. And he would tease me and say, this is a horrible idea for you to go into academia. I think, and, and I'd say, what do you think I should do, Dr. Kevin? And he said, you should be a dentist, which again, I just, I couldn't imagine doing that. 
Uh, but he had me intern in his office, and he was this beloved character. He had a great lifestyle. He lived a beautiful, a beautiful family, family man, and it sold me. So I went all in, I, knowing that I, I've always wanted a lot of kids. And so I then went to Ohio State for dental school, met my husband. We have four beautiful children, and we practiced for 26 years together. Wow. Well, I mean, you have what so many people strive for, what they dream of, but you mentioned that it felt like trappings, like you were trapped yeah. by some of those things. So let's um, let's kind of dig into that a little bit more. I mean, having all of these things, especially being able to maybe afford the nice house, the nice car, vacation, why did it feel like you weren't fully in the in the value of freedom and, and living out in, in a free, free, sovereign way? Well, I think that when, first of all, as a woman and a mom, a working mom, you always feel like you're never doing enough. I think when I was giving fully to my kids, I felt like I was neglecting my, you know, my, especially when you're a, a business owner. I'm like, oh, I'm neglecting running the business. When I would pour more time into the business, I definitely felt a lot of mom guilt about I wasn't giving to my kids the way I wanted to. So I think you're always balancing that, which is tough as a woman. Um, and then uh, so many times it's no matter how much we made over the years, we built this little practice to get this huge practice, uh, very successful. But no matter how much we made, we somehow found a way to spend it. <laughs> and, you know, it, we, we went to the bigger house. We it, So it, it did begin to feel like it was this hamster wheel that we were constantly you know, just, it, it, we were working so hard that we wanted to reward ourselves. And so it'd be like, we'd go on bigger vacation, we'd get the fancier car, oh, we need another home. And it feel it, it, when you look at it as a Bitcoiner, it starts to feel like this is a trap. This is what they want from us, is to work harder and to just keep the system going. Did you notice um, just prices going up, especially in sort of those more scarce assets like real estate? I mean, I'm thinking about just the conversation that a lot of people are having this week about Paul Krugman saying, oh, we should move the inflation target to 3%. Like, yes. we were, we're always, we, I feel like so many people, we don't study the financial system at a young age to be able to question something like the inflation rate. Did you, did you kind of notice, oh, things are getting more expensive, but I, I can keep up? I think for me, and I think this is a lot of people, and I'm, I'm, it's sort of a shame to say it. You know, again, as a business person, that I, I thought I was educated. I thought I understood the financial system, but I, I really thought it, inflation is natural. Of course, things get more expensive over time. Like, you know, it just, of course, a, a soft drink costs 25 cents when our parents were young, and it's a dollar fifty. I thought that that would, it, it's just the way things are. I didn't question it. I didn't question, you know, I, I, fractional reserve banking. I thought the Fed was a government entity. I knew the dollar wasn't backed by gold, but I didn't realize it was backed by no gold. <laughs> like, there's so many things that I didn't understand and, and just thought, why should I study that? Here I am. I'm successful. And I think that's by design. I think we're kept in the dark. I think we're, it's meant to be that we're not supposed to understand and just and, and even talking to so many of my normie friends now or my dentist friends now it's if they're doing okay they don't care to learn it's like it'll yeah. all be fine it, i mean it that meme about it's fine you know i hear it all the time yeah. why are you worrying about this it always ends up fine but in order to preserve your wealth, were you investing essentially in real estate before and maybe a stock portfolio? Or how were you seeing that ability to plan for your kids to hopefully, you know, have some some sort of a safety net and be able to to take care of their needs into the into the future? Yeah. So, I mean, absolutely just pretty traditional stock portfolio. We had a wealth manager we had, you know, uh, commercial real estate, um, some, tried to always have some passive investment. We owned our building for our practice, um, all these things, and, and did well. But when Tesla made the announcement in 2021 about that they had acquired Bitcoin, you know, when that came out, 
my stupid little Bitcoin on my phone that my, you know, rainy day that I would sock away a little bit. I looked at it and I was like, holy cow, my nothing investment that I really didn't pay attention to uh, was now a significant amount of money and had outperformed everything else that I had invested in. And that's when, of course, I, I started to see Bitcoin differently. To me, it became, oh, this is something that people can get rich on. I think that's the first thought that comes to your head. Uh, so I went full, I'm, I'm going to invest in altcoins, I'm going to find the next Bitcoin. Again, I believed in all of those fallacies. And, and, and it, I went full altcoin investing, I took trading classes, all those things. Oh, wow. Yeah, and, and, and did well. But it was a maxi on Twitter, a toxic maxi on Twitter. I just started to get um, onto Twitter in 2020. I'd been on for a long time, just not active. And it was a maxi, a toxic maxi who told me I'm an idiot and that I knew nothing about Bitcoin. And, you know, here I was, I'm like, well, I'm going to be retiring from, from my Bitcoin holdings. And he's like, I, I'm not even talking to you about it until you read one book. You've obviously read nothing. And that was for me, like, of course, I had many people tell me, you need to study Bitcoin, you need to read more, you need to, and I was like, I'm watching YouTube videos, I need, I know all I need to know. But getting me in at where it hurt most my ego, that is what caused me to really read the Bitcoin standard. And it opened my eyes to everything. Same here. Thank you, Safe yeah. Dean. I yeah. appreciate it so much. Um, <laughs> Yeah, Saifedean, Saifedean changed my life too. Uh, wait, so, okay, it was your son who first told you about Bitcoin. How did, yes. how did he know about it? And did you, I mean, you you clearly had a journey, right? It's like, no, this isn't a thing. I'm skeptical. Yes, maybe it's a thing. I'm going to invest a little, but I'll also venture out into all, all, all these other cryptocurrencies. Oh, no, this is the only, the, the, the real one that I should be relying on that has the properties of money. Can you talk about sort of that journey and, and how, how your son discovered it? Yeah. So my son, like most teenagers, you know, his age, he was 16, 17 at the time, were gaming. And so a lot of these young guys would talk about Bitcoin. And so, I mean, he came to me and he was like, you need to put, you need to buy, you know, 10,000 Bitcoin. <laughs> and I was absolutely not. And, but he didn't let up. I mean, it must have been six, seven months. And eventually he put an app on my phone. It, it makes me laugh. It was called Coin Mama. And he was Coin like, Mama? Mama? Coin Mama, I don't even, I, I, I keep meaning to look if it's still around, but it's, that's where I got my first Bitcoin. And so, and wow. I only did it because he installed it on my phone and it was too, he was relentless. So I, it was to shut him up. And so, wait, <laughs> what year was this and how old was he? 2018, he was 17. And so, okay, wow. yeah. And, and so I think my first buy was $20 of Bitcoin. And then. It, it, and again, it wasn't, I, I genuinely believed this was something that criminals use, that it was dark web stuff, that I didn't want anything to do with it. So I didn't look into it. I was, it was an easy buy on my phone. And so, but then I would kind of, I never really paid attention to news stories or anything like that. I would just, but if I didn't go to Starbucks that more, that week or, oh, I didn't, you know, get my hair cut or I, it's, I'm just going to buy some Bitcoin this week. So I was buying like little $20 here, $10 there for, you know, three years. Wow. Okay. So, I mean, for you to go from kind of, you know, dipping your toe in, buying it here and there in, in place of what you might spend on a coffee to actually selling your home and putting it into Bitcoin. Yeah. And how did how did you get to that level of conviction that this is something that's here to stay and it is the best investment I could possibly make? It really went, it, it, to me, the difference between um, crypto investors and Bitcoiners is Bitcoiners are always so well read and they study so much. And my life motto is to always be in this growth environment around people smarter than me. And when I kept hearing from these people who are smarter than me, this is what I believe in. You know, I mean, there's people, you, Preston Tish, James Lavish, Frank Fox, so many of these people, Jeff Booth, you know, that I'm like, I, I look up to them so much and they put their money where their mouth is. 
And then I would study a little more and I'd read a book that they'd recommend and I'd, you know, learn a little more. Something, some light bulb would go on and, you know, things like uh, my real estate holdings, they've done well, but they didn't do as well as my Bitcoin. It was, it, and then when I say, oh, you know, this inflation isn't natural. These things are, yes, it looks like it's my homes are worth so much more, but it's really the money is worth that much less. There's such a shift when you study and you're not all about the money that you realize things are so broken and it makes you want to do something to help change the system. Yeah. Well, you know, I'm curious because I totally agree with the people that have sort of made it in the fiat sense and they're doing okay financially. They probably don't have a reason to question the system that's working for them. But why do you think that we're having such a tough time breaking through to the normies and really getting a significant amount of the working class that is really struggling with um, the the disadvantages of the current system and with inflation. Why aren't they taking a look at this as an alternative just in coming to it in droves? Well, I, I think when Bitcoin is doing well, I know my experience is my phone text messages, email is blowing up. Like in 21, I, I had everybody just so excited about Bitcoin and crypto at the time as well. Like, you know, everyone was ready to quit their jobs and become full-time traders. It seemed like you could do no wrong. But I know since then, like there's some members of my family who in late 21, they were ready to invest a significant amount into Bitcoin. And then it's these terrible, you know, FTS and Doquan and all these things, they hear these things and they just don't trust it. It sounds like some, it, it sounds like a scam to them. And I think, again, that's intentional to have all of these things seem like their, their Bitcoin. And it scares people off, especially like my parents' generation. It, it's terrifying for them. Well, what will change that? I, I think one of the best things Bitcoiners do is to differentiate Bitcoin, not crypto. It's something that I say all the time is that, you know, if you understand what Bitcoin is, and then if I have family members who start asking me about, you know, Dogecoin or something, you know, Ethereum, and I just start talking about this is how it's different, I will, I'll see a little bit of the light bulb go on. But I think until we see, you know, legacy finance really, I, I think, I think these ETFs, coming on the line will be terrific for older investors and give it a more legitimacy that will make a difference. It's time for a quick break to hear these messages from my partners. Fold is the best Bitcoin rewards debit card and shopping app in the world. You can earn Bitcoin on everything you purchase from Amazon to groceries to your Bitcoin conference tickets with Fold's Bitcoin cashback debit card. And you can win free Satoshis every day or even play for a whole Bitcoin by spinning the rewards wheel. You can also buy Bitcoin and stack sats directly on Fold and earn even more incentives and rewards. This is a great app to get someone totally new into Bitcoin and way better than earning airline miles or hotel points. Head to foldapp.com slash Natalie. And if you use my link, you'll get up to 10,000 sats when you sign up for Spin or Spin Plus and spend at least $20 on the card. I'm so excited to share that I have partnered with CoinKite and we are committed to making sure everyone has the information they need to safely self-custody their Bitcoin. CoinKite produces the cold card wallet, which is the cold storage device I am switching to for safekeeping my Bitcoin. It is Bitcoin only. You can verify the source code. It's ultra secure. And as I'm learning, it's easy to use even if you're a beginner. If you head to their site in my show notes, you can find all of their products from cold cards in different colors to seed plates, top signers, sats cards, block clocks, which I have behind me, and more. I'm also in the process of creating some how-to videos on cold card. So watch out for those in the near future. Become your own bank with Bitcoin and CoinKite. All right, back to the show. So did you actually have a, a conversation with your husband at one point and say, you know what, we should sell our house and put all of that money into Bitcoin? Yes, <laughs> I did. <laughs> How did that go? Um, at first he said, okay, he was willing to sell the house because the carrot I had at the end is let's sell our house and retire. So the idea, dentistry got really tough during COVID. Like we've seen um, 
dental offices are getting getting bought up by VC money. And so just the landscape of dentistry is really changing. It's becoming um, just a financial mill in a lot of cases. So that part of it, we just see things that we didn't like. Um, and then COVID made it so that for the first time in our lives, we had problems with retaining staff. And we've never had that before. Wow. So, yeah. So he so he was getting a little burnout about the business aspect of it. And so I, I did hold the carrot, like, we can just get out. If we sell the house, then we just, you know, reassess things a little bit. We can get out. So he liked that. He was not super excited about the, and let's invest all in Bitcoin. So, and I, and it's not like I sold and we bought all Bitcoin. Like I still, we're sitting on some cash, but I did. There's a few things that triggered and like, or someone would say to me like, Oh, this, this looks like this. And I would buy Bitcoin now. So I slow, I have DCA every week and I have since uh, 2021, but there are things that I'm still buying more and more. So I think we all feel like we could never have enough Bitcoin. (laughs) Yeah, no, that's, That's for sure. I mean, coming in when you did in 2019, did you feel that sense? Like I'm late. And what do you say to people who are watching this, who feel that they're too late now? Um, I, I, yes, I did feel like I was late. I, I definitely, especially since I did start to get into these like, you know, micro alt shit coins that were cents, you know, fractions of a cent. And, you know, you get, you, the greed creeps in pretty easily and quickly and you just think I'm going to find the next Bitcoin before you study anything. Um, and so uh, it, all I say is just study, study, study. And I think the more you read and learn about Bitcoin, the more you'll realize that it, 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 it I think it's inevitable. Mm-hmm. I agree with you. Um, you know, I, I know that this, answer might be a little bit complex and we don't have to get into the weeds, but, you know, having studied Bitcoin and, and knowing your industry dentistry and, and how the incentives have sort of been broken and have led to things like, you know, small offices being gobbled up by these other companies, maybe less uh, focus being put on actual patient care, um, which you and I have talked about offline because I've had some issues with the dentists recently. Um, I mean, do, how do you think and and how would you explain simply how Bitcoin could address things like broken incentives in in things like dentistry, but also you know really any industry and corporations? I think having sound money will allow things like. Uh, us to get rid of insurance, which I think just breaks the whole system. When when we're not paying the actual value of goods and services because our money has no value, it it just undermines everything. And uh, so, you know, I think, for example, in dentistry, the amount that most insurance pays, maximum per year is $1,500. So people who feel terrible about about not having dental insurance, I usually tell them, well, your insurance would only pay $1,500 a year, so you're probably better off just putting away $100 a month. Um, But that $1,500 amount hasn't changed since the 70s. The 70s. Whereas dentistry has become astronomically expensive compared to that. Yeah. So, And I I think it's – and so who's the benefit of that? It's not patients. It's not dentists. It's the corporations because that is how our, you know, that's how our money works. It just, yeah, it, it doesn't benefit. I don't think it benefits the true producers or the, you know, the people who need services. Yeah, well, I, I had an issue with what I thought was a small family dentist office. It turns out, no, there's a corporation that owns it. There's a corporation behind it. And now I, I end up wondering if they actually really had, um, you know, my best interest at heart or if they were trying to make money. And I think a lot of people feel that way in a, a ton of different fields and industries. Yeah, it, it, I know it's happening in medicine. I know it's happening in veterinary medicine. It's definitely happening in dental offices. We were approached by several of these large um, BC, you know, um, hedge fund owned dental chains. And it's intentional and it's that they don't want you to know that they're owned by these corporations. So the fact that you did not know 
that was by design because what they do, for example, they wanted to buy our office. And in the contract they had, and we did not sell to a large corporation. We sold to a solo dentist in the end. But it was in the contract that the office would keep our name. We had to agree that it would stay Riley Dental because they wanted the public to believe this was still a small office. Right. Well, I, I want to ask you about your, your retirement because you decided to go to Hawaii. And right now I know Hawaii is just facing one of the worst tragedies in, in history. I mean, this wildfire, I know someone that you know close to you was impacted. Can you share um, just a little bit of an update and, and how people can help? Because it seems like everyone knows someone, right? Everyone has a friend there, maybe a loved one, a family member. Um, what exactly happened? Because this is just I've I covered fires for many years as a reporter. I've never seen anything like this and the amount of, of lives lost. So what do you want to share? I, what we are hearing from friends there, we have several friends who are over there helping with the relief effort. My sister went over and was covering some of the news about it. It is so much worse than the public knows right now. Uh, the number of children and elderly who've lost their lives, it, the number that's coming out now is minuscule compared to what's going to happen. And, and that's a certainty. So it, it's beyond tragedy. And uh, what we're seeing over there is that the most help is coming from locals. It's not that there's a huge mistrust of FEMA there. And, and there's a lot of blockade of aid going on. So most of the meaningful aid that we're seeing is is private citizens who are getting Starlinks and and you know distributing them or starting food and soup kitchens and delivering them because a lot of people don't have cars they don't have access to gas they don't have so the you know I think Red Cross was setting up like places to gather to go pick up food but people couldn't get there like so it's but it was it was locals who are getting on bikes and delivering it. Or um, I know here on Oahu, where we are, that there's um, people flying over themselves. They're taking boats themselves to deliver aid. So my wish is that everybody, um, if you do want to give to this tragedy, that there's still I mean, immense need there, um, is to give to one of the local funds, not the Red Cross, not the United Way, but to something like, if you go to lahanafirefund.com, it takes you to a GoFundMe, and it's a local who's done incredible work on the ground, and he also um, puts up, he has a YouTube channel that you can see, I mean, he shows what they're doing and um, the impact that they're, you know, and difference that they're making there. I completely agree. I, I, I'm i sure that a lot of those big um, nonprofit organizations are well-intentioned, but there's a lot of bureaucracy and some of the money does not end up where you want it to go. And I think that if you can donate directly, if you can find the smaller on the ground organizations or the people themselves or the small businesses, it's so much better to send directly. And with something like Bitcoin, you can literally just send it and instantly it'll settle, you know, in their in their um, wallets. And so I think that that's an incredible. Do you want to share the story of um, Wyland and the gallery and some of the good that's come from from a, from that tragic situation? Oh, yeah. So uh, my sister's friend, Wyland, uh, Robert Wyland, he's an artist. He, he's had a um, one of his first galleries. And his first gallery in Hawaii uh, was on Front Street in uh, Lahaina, burned to the ground. Um, but uh, his bronze sculptures, uh, they all survived, even though everything else was just devastated. And so he just, um, on Friday, had an auction for the bronze pieces that did survive the fire, and they were able to raise thirty-seven thousand for the for the relief efforts there. So, um, yeah, but but so many of the things just uh, that downtown. Anyone who's been knows what a special place it was. Those buildings were many hundred years old and older, and it, it just will never be able to be replaced. No, it's so historic and and it was beautiful to see some of the the statues that survived in this rubble and the fact that they can go to do do so much good. I, I'm so grateful that so much money was raised and and so much more is needed. So um, I'm going to link in the show notes just in case um, we'll put some of the 
uh, the organizations that Susie mentioned, just in case anyone wants to donate. Um, I know Haley Lennon, she's in the Bitcoin community. Her family lost a historic in. So a lot of people really, really impacted. And just because the the news changes does not mean that they're not dealing with this. Because I know that sometimes, you know, the story changes and we turn to the next tragedy, but those people are still there dealing with it. So anything we can do to just remember and honor the people that, that are lost, um, hopefully people can, can help in any small way. So thank you for sharing that. Um, I want to turn to, you know, another uh, effort that you have in order to help, and that's a clinic in El Zante in El Salvador, which is the first place to legalize Bitcoin uh, as tender. Can you talk a little bit about that and wh what you're doing there, why it's needed? So, yeah, I was able to go to um, El Salvador for the first time in 2021 and just fell in love with it. Fell, I love El Zante um, and have been fortunate to go down several times since. But there is an enormous need in the El Zante area, which that and the surrounding, Bitcoin Beach and the surrounding areas is about 12,000 people. And there's no um, medical clinic. So I know a few, I've met a few Bitcoiners who've been, who've spent time down there and there's been some sort of accident, you know, it's a beach yeah. cut or something. And they had to go back and drive all the way back to San Salvador to get medical attention. Which is um, hours. Yeah. It, yeah. And so, and, or if you need a prescription, you've got to go to the next town to, to fill a prescription. So um, there's no medical clinic. There's no place. Uh, there's a dentist there who's doing um, restorative work for patients, which is wonderful, but no, uh, just care, no dental care in terms of cleanings and things like that. So no dental clinic and no pharmacy. And so uh, fortunately, I was able to hook up through Hope House with this wonderful group of women, three sisters. The oldest is a physician. The youngest is in dental school. And the middle one, I believe, is, is um, she's in a biology program. So uh, that we teamed up with them to build and run this medical clinic there. So we have the, the site that is right in, um, in the El Zante area for the clinic. And uh, because it has to serve so many needs, we will, they will run it, they will operate it, they will own it, but then we'll have people like my husband and I who will come a month or two out of the year and just donate our time and, um, and treat locals. And so the idea is, is that it will be state of the art and can treat people who are visiting and expats who live there, but for the local community, it will offer reduced fee care um, and that'll be done through the help of um, volunteers. It's time for another quick break to hear these messages from my partners. Next up, I want to share with you about CrowdHealth, which is a Bitcoin alternative to health insurance. Health insurance costs are sky high today and you send your money every month to a massive corporation and then you never see that money again, even if you don't need a doctor. But if you do need care, you end up having to pay even more out of pocket, especially if you end up as one of the 20% of claims on average that aren't covered. CrowdHealth is all about community and the community crowdfunds everyone's health care. So if something happens to you and you need medical care, CrowdHealth negotiates down the medical bill lower than what insurance would be, and then the community helps you cover it. And in turn, you help cover others' needs, which has been so rewarding. I am so glad I switched to this program. And for more information, you can head to joincrowdhealth.com slash Natalie and use promo code Natalie for a discount. I am so excited to share that I have joined Orange Pill app as an advisor. If you haven't downloaded this app yet, you are missing out on connecting with Bitcoiners in your area. The Orange Pill app is building the social layer for Bitcoin and helping to create opportunities for in-person connections and community building. You can create a profile and you will see lots of familiar faces there. And then you can search for Bitcoiners or Bitcoin events based on your location. I am geotagged in my home base, St. Louis, and I'm super grateful because the Orange Pill app has helped connect me with Bitcoiners in my new city. So come join us, download the Orange Pill app and head to theorangepillapp.com for more information. Wow. That's amazing. It's so, yeah, it's so incredible. Fun that you're a part of that. I'm sure you're really excited to go back. I think so many amazing things are happening there. And I remember visiting Hope House and, and hope is really the perfect word because so many of the women that I met there 
they wanted to leave just a, maybe five, 10 years before that. They all dreamt of coming to the United States and try, you know, trying to figure out ways that they could sort of get out of El Salvador in order to have any opportunity. And now they're making things happen there and they have such pride for where they come from. And so to be able to build on that and actually invest in the country, I have such high hopes. I know that people have, you know, they're skeptical of government, which we should be, and obviously a yeah. president that that's legalizing it. And and I'm sure there it, nothing's perfect, but I think that there's a lot of hope and a lot of good that can come to El Salvador, especially with the the Bitcoin adoption there. So that's amazing. Hopefully, we'll be going to the what is it the the having party there, right? Oh yes, I plan on going to the having party, but. Uh, I do agree with you with the hope that I'm seeing just with these women that we are um, partnering with. Uh, they grew up with their parents in the United States. They uh, they literally raised themselves in a, this small shack. Um, parents would send back money. They're, they went there with their brother, who was all, he's still in the United States. But it's so neat to see as they are, you know, becoming women and professionals, um, their parents and now their brother is talking about coming back to El Salvador as well. And their brother and his wife had initially said, you know, five years ago, they had no desire to ever be in El Salvador again. Wow. It's incredible. It really is incredible. I mean, to think, I mean, it's people talk about and politicize the border crisis, but to empower the people of your nation to actually want to build there so that there's like a reverse immigrant. They want to come home. I, I mean, you don't really see that. Yeah. yeah, it's it's amazing. Well, turning to a, an, a lighter note, um, I love your Twitter X, whatever <laughs> you call it. Page. Yes. You make you make people laugh. You sometimes gross them out with <laughs> the more graphic posts. Um, yeah. Tell me a little bit about like your inspiration for that, because one thing that I love about you is some people take themselves very seriously in this space, and I'm probably guilty of that too. You know, I I, I just want to make sure I have all my information right, and and I feel like it's such a duty to 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 tell people about you know these topics. But at the end of the day, life you got to have a little fun too. So what is what was the genesis of some of these these posts? Because now you have a a, a pretty good following. <laughs> Well, you know, I'm sympathetic to all of you who, ha you know, you, you work in Bitcoin and you have podcasts because you do have to think about that. And that's sort of where I was. I, I lived and worked in my community and I had kids in school. So uh, you really censor yourself in life and you have to. You, you know, I, I could not be who I am on Twitter. <laughs> I could not have been that way in my community. Um, but what I realized is that's kind of who I really am. Like I am, you know, kind of goofy and it, it's been so freeing to whatever silly thing pops up in my head because it, it, it doesn't matter for me now that I can put it out there. And, it, and I, I, I laugh all the time. Um, and it was Twitter who, did I ever think I would create a meme? No, I, I knew what a meme was. My kids are always telling me, but I never thought I would create one, but it was through Twitter and seeing more, um, serious memes that were treated in a light-hearted way that I really understood the importance and significance of memes, that we live in this society now where people just want to read a headline and they're not going to read the article. And memes allow you to just get that snapshot of sometimes really difficult or hard to conceive concepts or and present it in a comedic way. And yeah. you know, it's so easy to share those pictures that make you laugh. And but I like that they make you think. So I know one of my early ones was these two guys, each in separate boats that were sinking, and they were both bailing into each other's boats. And, <laughs> yeah. it, and it was, you know, I said, uh, the one was the federal government that they issue bonds to, you know, to get rid of debt. And then the other was the several banks that they, you know, buy those bonds to print money. And it was this, you know, horse. And I made that because I read something about, oh, the government doesn't print money. I read this on Twitter. You know, they use financial in instruments to to issue debt. And I was like, but that's exactly what you're saying. And I think a picture and a meme like that can can really, like, I have people say, oh, oh, like, I think you get it sometimes when yeah. reading these difficult things you don't. So I I love a meme, me a meme, and, and it, I have so much fun, um, you know. 
I, I love yours. I don't know where you find all the in images. I love the ones that are super uh, tongue in cheek or you think it's one thing and then you look deeper and it's highly inappropriate. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, one of my favorites was when you made the the women the women in Bitcoin, but it's yes. all the guys, but as yes. women. <laughs> but I love, you know, you are the genesis of that meme. So I know. It was, and you, so, you made you made a very awkward situation for me more lighthearted. So, <laughs> and that's what it was supposed to be. Like I think some people, you know, I, I, I knew the situation you were in with that, and and here are people, you know, you're trying to do this good thing, and I knew what you meant by saying that, but then I, I did. I wanted. I think that comedy can take the. Yeah, you know, the air out of this balloon Take sometimes. The edge off. So, yes, and, and, and it was great for me to see who responded well to that. Of the way, you know, I became friends with some people be on that meme because of that meme, and I, I love someone who doesn't take themselves too seriously and can understand comedy. And yeah, you know, and then there are others who were not happy about it. So, but those aren't my people, I guess. I thought it was amazing. I was so, I mean, it's amazing now what you can create too with, with AI and stuff. It looks so realistic. I'm like, that, that is exactly what they would look like. You know? Well, what, what I loved is when I had flipped it and done you as a guy and, and, oh. and I didn't even know you then. And you were like, that looks exactly like my brother. My brother yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it was wild. If you guys are not following Susie, it's at Susie B D D S and she's phenomenal. So you, everyone has to, has to follow her. I'm sure you have something up your, up your sleeve that we, uh, we're going to laugh at very soon. Um, why, why do you make it such a habit to go to Bitcoin events? And do you think that more people should do that? Cause I feel like, you know, there aren't, there aren't a lot of people that have gone to as many conferences as you. And I think you're, you're a really important part of the, of the community as a result. Oh, I, for me, that I can have all these internet stranger friends that, you know, I've met, but there's no, nothing that beats meeting everybody in person, whether they be plebs or influencers. I think to, sur again, surround yourself with people that are smarter than you and it elevates what, you, where you go on this journey. You'll never regret it. And the one thing I'll hear is it's so expensive. I, I will get DMs like that all the time. Like, how are you going to be? It's so expensive. And I just say, you don't have to go to the conference. In fact, I've been to a conference before that I went to very few of the, you know, presentations and that it's just about hanging with other like-minded people who are smarter than you or they're guaranteed you will meet somebody in so many different areas of your life that know a lot more about it than you that you will learn something about. So I, I can't recommend enough going to Bitcoin events. I'm so grateful for every time that I get to spend time with you in person because so many of us are scattered. You're now in Hawaii. Some of us are in the Midwest, East Coast, LA, overseas. You know, it's just really nice to to come together because there is something about meeting a Bitcoiner where all of a sudden you just you say that word and maybe not everything's aligned. We're still very different and diverse, but there's something deeply in common that is so special um and 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 you know something clicks and i think that that's so important it's really really nice to to connect with bitcoiner so i'm excited Absolutely. to get to see you very very soon um anything else you you want to share especially maybe for the folks out there who you know are more of the the newbies and newcomers and they're far off from being able to sell something like their house and put and put a bunch of money into bitcoin i mean a lot of people struggling right now just any, any final takeaways or messages? Yeah, I think my two huge ones is just just read. Read about Bitcoin. You know, there's so many incredible books. Obviously, Safedine, I think um, Knut Svanholm, his books are amazing. You know, everybody should um, read uh, Price of Tomorrow. There's, you can read a book a week and you still won't be through everything you need to read. So that's my first thing. And it was, again, the huge difference for me between crypto people and Bitcoiners. Bitcoiners always seem to be trying to further their knowledge on things, you know, no matter if it's you know, diet or medicine or, you know, that, or the financial world, the economy. So that's something I really appreciate. Read, read, read. And then my other big one is don't put more money into Bitcoin that then would be comfortable for you. I think that if you're just looking into it to make a lot of money, it will give you anxiety and won't give you that freedom that you want. 
Whereas if you, it can be money that you're like, okay, that's just, just the amount that if I were to lose it all, I would be comfortable with that. I don't, I know Bitcoin will never go to zero, but I know that people, if, if it's, you're struggling and you just want to put away enough to, to feel like you have your, a piece of the pie, then that's what I say do that then it's, you'll feel comfortable and want to learn more. And that will be where you take your allocation. The more you know, that will drive that. That's such a good point. You know, Matthew Cratter had that video that Michael Saylor shared a couple days yeah. ago, which was that, you know, should I put 100% into Bitcoin? Well, if you have to ask, then maybe yeah. you haven't done enough homework. Uh, yes. you, should put, you should put in how much you've researched and what you actually feel comfortable with. And so obviously our allocations are probably greater than the average person, but we've spent, we've spent the year studying. And honestly, I mean, you mentioned uh, everybody and including you in that list. I mean, if I'm wrong, I'm on, I'm wrong on the right team. So. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. This is who I want to be wrong with. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Susie, thank you so much for, for joining me. Hopefully we'll have you back on and I can't wait to see you in person. Thanks so much, Nat. Thank you so much for watching the video version of the show. I really want to hear from you. If you have suggestions or guest recommendations, you can email me at natalie at talkingbitcoin.com. Please subscribe if you want more content and I'll see you next time.